Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today, welcome. This is the RE Tipster Podcast, and in today's show, you might notice my voice is a little off. I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize, but uh, in today's show, we're talking with a man named Mike Ferreira, and Mike is somebody who's actually one of the, the very early members of the RE Tipster Club membership site way back in the day when we got started. I think it was about 2015 when you were part of this, Mike. But Mike is somebody that uh, I've wanted to talk to for quite a while now because he's somebody who has really brought his land investing business to the next level. Like, I think he sort of qualifies as what we might call a rock star simply because he does lots of volume. He does this full time. It's his main gig. And he's just got a lot of very relevant experience I mean, not just in, in flipping land, but also in things like seller financing. I know that's been a really big part of his business. And I think he's got a lot of wisdom to share. And I'm excited to, to talk with him today. So there's a lot more I can say about Mike, but instead of me blathering on, um, Mike, why don't you introduce yourself quick and just, uh, I don't maybe in like, I don't know, 30 or 60 seconds, just tell us the story of like how you first learned about land investing and what made you decide to give this a shot? All right, Seth. Uh, well, when I got started, uh, I was coming off the tail end of a previous business. I had a business buying and selling gold and silver. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of those business models that there's not so much of anymore. But then it, people would box up all their gold and silver and mail it to me. Mm -hmm. And... I would evaluate it and send them a check. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there, there was a time when that business was at its peak and it was just fantastic. It was very lucrative. It was fun. And I could do it from home and I loved it. Uh, but as time went on, a lot of things changed with that business, regulations and just the market changed. Everything changed in. I knew that that was something that was not going to be sustainable for me. So I wanted to find something else. Um, at that time, I had been watching a lot of those uh, house flipping shows, uh, flipping Vegas and all of that type of thing. And that was what I was considering at first. Uh, but as I looked into it a little bit more and actually did some home renovations of my own, I quickly realized that just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went down some internet rabbit holes and somehow discovered land investing. It may have been from your blog. Honestly, I don't remember the first contact I had uh, with that idea, uh, but it made a lot of sense to me. So I just began learning everything I could possibly learn about it. And in 2015, I got started mm -hmm. and once I saw that it would work, um, there was just no turning back. Yeah, interesting. Now, just from my own personal curiosity, this gold business that you were doing, what, what is it that makes that a good time or a bad time to be in that kind of business? Is it basically like when the, when the cost or the price of gold is really, really high, that's what makes the opportunity ripe? And then it's sort well, of worse as the price comes down? Or how did that change? Uh, in general, what happened with me, a part of it, I was in the right place at the right time where the real estate was tanking, the economy was stumbling. So people needed money for one thing or another. Gold and silver prices were shooting straight up and I just timed it right. Yeah. Okay. And there was a time, if you recall, if you're in any kind of major, uh, uh, suburban or metropolitan area, there were guys waving signs, cash for oh, yeah. gold on every street corner. Yeah. And then suddenly they all went away. Yeah. Well, there was a reason they all went away. Yeah. It's not such a great thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It sounds like, uh, you know, you were doing that, the whole gold precious metal business. Um, and when that kind of fell apart, you decided to jump in to land with both, both feet. I mean, this is you pretty much made a clean break from that and decided to do this full time through all your, all your weight and your effort behind this. Is that right? You weren't sort of like doing this part time. It was just like, no, this is going to be my new thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, you know, I, 
I dabbled a little part time with still wondering if I should try to keep the other business going or, or not. And then there just came a point. Um, I read a Seth uh, Godin book. I'm trying to think of the name. It was the. He's got was, a lot of books. I know. Yeah, oh, <laughs> they're all pretty good. Yeah, I remember that. It was the 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 not the tipping point or not, the, something about making the dip. Sure. The dip yeah. That's it. I yeah. read that, and uh, somehow either it was something contained in that book, or I used that to justify it to myself just to drop the old business mm -hmm. and go straight to uh, land. Yeah. And the big motivator for me was that if it didn't work, I would probably have to get a job. And that idea to me was so horrific. Yeah. That yeah. It gave me the inspiration to make sure I made this work no matter what. I think what makes your story a little unique is that like when I think about my experience in the land business, like it's always been a part-time thing for me. Like it's never been something where I've it's been my only thing and all of my eggs were in that basket and my whole future depended on the rise or fall of my business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I know are like that where they sort of get started as a side gig and you know, it's just kind of how a lot of people uh, run the show and you're somebody who it's like, no, like, this is going to be it. Like this is going to be the main thing and I'm going to make this work. So when you're getting started, like I know when I was getting started, I did, I think about, th about 30 deals my first year and they were all pretty small. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just making a lot of movements and figuring things out and bumping into walls. And like, I definitely could not have lived off that income by itself in that first year. For you, how long did it take until, you know, you, you sort of worked the kinks out, you knew what you were doing, and this was a big enough operation and the income was smooth enough that like you could officially live off this, not just live off your savings or some other source of income. I'd say it was approximately a year. Okay. Um, I, honestly, I don't remember exactly when that point was. Part of it is I'm I'm not good with dates, but part of the reason is the same reason that I am just not able to do like one thing part time and another thing part time. With me, the only successes I've had in life was when I was a hundred percent focused yeah. on one thing. Mm -hmm. Just this one thing I became absolutely obsessed with buying and selling land yeah. and that's what I did so my I put my head down for years mm -hmm. and except for family obligations and such there was nothing else mm -hmm. it was just that yeah uh, and you know that's another thing I I've experienced myself and I've heard from a lot of other people in the land businesses they kind of get distracted from time to time like another little business opportunity will come up or something else seems fun and do you ever get that where you're sort of tempted to like start running after a different thing that sounds like a shiny object syndrome or are you pretty good at just saying like, no, like I don't care about anything else right now. Land is a priority. Pretty, pretty much. Um, every once in a while I'll, I'll get distracted. I'll listen to some podcast that starts off talking about land and then the word mobile homes will pop up and I'm like, Hmm, mobile homes <laughs> because it's close. I have so many people who buy land who want to buy land for mobile homes. So mm. that comes up, but then I get over that in about an hour. Maybe I'm, I'm like, no, 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 no. Just keep mm. doing what I'm doing. Nothing's sure. going to get me the return that I'm getting from doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I think that that right there is a really good takeaway for a lot of people. Just, as difficult as it may be or as it may seem, just the value of focusing and deciding like this one thing, like that's going to be my thing. I'm not going to get sidetracked by all the other stuff because like there is always stuff in the world mm -hmm. that can tear you away from my priorities and it takes a lot of discipline, probably a lot more work for some people than others. It doesn't sound like it's that hard for you. And I know some people, it's very hard to focus on one thing, but there's a lot of uh, inherent value in the ability to do that. Your first step when you were getting started, you know, direct mail, I know for a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm assuming that was like your first step in, in terms of like just starting the marketing process and starting to find deals. For a lot of people, that's kind of a hard trigger to pull in, in the very beginning because you don't really know what you're doing. You're just kind of following somebody's instructions and you don't, there's no guarantees of how much, if anything is going to come back from that. Was that a hard thing for you to do? And like, how big was your first campaign? How did that go? 
<laughs> well, I remember my first campaign was probably 200 letters. Mm -hmm. And I hand wrote every envelope. Oh, really? Letters. I remember that. I Because I remember it was right before Christmas time, I believe. And I put Christmas stamps on the envelopes because <laughs> I wanted it to look like they were getting a Christmas card and all oh. that type of thing. And uh, so I remember doing that. And that, that 200, actually, I was pretty lucky. It yielded me a few deals. Uh, so that got my appetite yeah. going. Yeah. I really had no idea what I was doing mm -hmm. at that time. I really didn't. Was that um, was that the first and last time you ever hand wrote stuff on envelopes, or did you try to do that a lot? Oh no, that was the last time. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Yeah. For yeah. that, yeah. That's how it goes for a lot of. I know. I I did that. I think twice. I'm surprised I did it twice, but mm -hmm. it was a long, painful experience. And yeah. it like chewed up an entire weekend. How long did it take mm -hmm. you to do all that for 200 letters? Jeez, I don't remember. I think I did little clumps at a time. Mm -hmm. So over a course of a couple of days or a few days, I got it knocked out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's not, not that there's any way to like, prove it one way or another, but do you think you got a higher response rate or acceptance rate as a result of doing that? Or was it totally not worth it? I would, to tell you the truth, I would rather not know. <laughs> if, it, if it, if it turned out I did, I would be tempted to figure out a way to do that more. And I just don't want to. Yeah. Um, now up until very recently, I've used handwritten fonts, mm -hmm. uh, nice colored envelopes, for all my mailings, but mm -hmm. I am not, that's not based on any scientific uh, evaluation at all. It's just because I thought maybe it would be a good idea. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So for you, you know, I know there's sort of like a couple stages when most people get into this, there's like the light bulb moment when you sort of see the legitimacy behind the business model. It's like, yeah, I think there's something here. And then there's like a second light bulb moment when you actually get your first accepted contract or you do your first deal. And it's like, whoa, it actually worked. Um, for you, did that second light bulb moment happen like right after that first campaign? Or when were you like officially sold on this? Like, I'm going to do this big time. Uh, honestly, it was, it was several months in. Um, I, my, my first, very first deal went well for a first deal. So mm -hmm. that was great. Um, and I had, I had some other decent ones that came in, not deals that I would probably seek now, but mm -hmm. they, they worked and I made money, but I still, my particular case, I still had this kind of love hate relationship with my existing business and was struggling whether I should completely let it go. So I had that in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, which slowed it, the process down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say probably about 20 deals in, then I knew that I was just going to go crazy with this thing. Yeah. And that was going to be it. Yeah. yeah. Now for the, those first 20 deals or I don't know, your first few campaigns, were you pursuing like just like anything and everything or the really cheap stuff or were you targeting your results in any way and then like what are you doing now like what have you learned you don't want to pursue and what do you try to go after these days uh well what i did is absolutely not what i would recommend mm -hmm. for anyone okay. to do but i live an area about 30 minutes away from where i knew there were tons of vacant lots mm -hmm. old uh, florida subdivisions that were platted out in the 70s and mm -hmm. still huge swaths are undeveloped and it's in areas where there's infill lots as well there seems uh, to be a lot of that in florida am i, am yeah, I right there is there yeah. is there definitely is mm -hmm. so i already knew about these areas where there are inexpensive vacant lots and my thinking at the time was, I'll just do that area. And boy, I can drive there, put up the signs, take pictures of the lots, do all these things myself. So mm -hmm. that's how I started. Mm -hmm. Just 
convenience and fear of doing something remote more remotely than that mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah. And why is it that you would not recommend that? Like, did it go bad for you in some way or? It didn't go bad, but it's really impossible to scale it mm-hmm. doing yeah. it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, it's doing just the same small geographical area over and over. Well, I still do. I still do mailings to that area and I buy and sell in that area all the time. Mm-hmm. It just to scale up, you need to expand out a little bit more. Yeah. And between fire ant bites and <laughs> alligator encounters and all kinds of different things, it's just, you know, it just does not make sense mm-hmm. for the business owner to be out there doing it. And it's just, it's not necessary either. So So. were you like, was your intent to go out and like visit each one of these properties in person before you would get involved with them? Is that part of why you were doing it? Uh, Originally? Yes. Okay. And even my first deal, the seller lived about three and a half hours away from me. I was so excited to get that deal done. I brought the paperwork and drove Mm. (laughs) to do it uh, in person. Yeah. yeah, because I, you know, yeah. I didn't know any better. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very familiar. That's yeah. the exact same thing I did in the beginning. And yeah, it's it's really not that yeah. scalable or sustainable to do it that way. I mean, you can certainly do stuff, but if that's all you're ever willing to do, it's like there's only so far you can go with that. So are you working outside of Florida now, I take it? or No, right now I'm still just in Florida. Okay. And, and the only reason for that right now is that there's just so much available. I don't really have a much of a need to go into other States Mm -hmm. and plus I know the laws and everything, but I, there are other States that I'm interested in getting into, but I just haven't had the need. I've been able to do everything I wanted to do just in Florida. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any like, uh, I don't know, big or impressive or interesting deals you've done that you are, willing to talk about in terms of like specifics and like what the situation was, was it like, uh, like I know there's, there's a couple deals I always reference all the time just cause they were so, you know, the numbers are big and they're impressive and it was a fun deal to talk about. Anything stick out in your mind? Yeah, I have a few. Uh, yeah. One thing though, just the way I do things, I have no problem with just making lots of base hits. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't need to make, home runs or do big expensive deals. Yeah. I can I am happy to place lots of small bets all over mm-hmm. the table than one big bet in one spot. Yeah. Um that that I, right there I think is another key takeaway I hope people are listening to because that uh there's a lot to be said for that especially if you want to scale to your level like mm-hmm. you sort of have to be okay with that because if you're only going to wait for home runs it's like there's only yeah. so many of those that come along, you know. Right. Right. Now, like an example of something that was on a higher price end of what I do, uh, there was a lady I sent a letter to. Uh, she had a lot that I offered seven thousand dollars for. Mm-hmm. It was a two and a half acre lot in Florida. She contacted me, accepting the offer, and she said, "Hey, I have another one, just a few lots down. Do you want that one as well?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, I'll take it. Um, because I knew there would be some more upside to that. That's the only deal I have done thus far through a title company. I've never used a title company for anything else, but I decided I wanted to go through title on this. Mm -hmm. So I I got the property. I needed some cash for more acquisitions at the time because I do so much, so heavy on owner financing that I sold one for 26,000 cash. Oh, nice. Like, right away, right off the bat in like a weekend. Yeah. So then I had the other one. I said, okay, this one I'll do owner financing on. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder what I can get for it. So mm-hmm. I threw it out there for 46,000 owner financing and it almost immediately. Whoa. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so that was great. So I, the first cash deal paid for both properties plus profit there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and money to get more property with. And now uh, the second one, it's seven, I think something like $760 a month for mm-hmm. 10 years. I charge a pretty high interest rate. So 
it really adds up. So between those two deals with document fees and all the interest and everything, it's probably close to $100,000 by the time it's done. And, and say again, how much did you put in? Like what was your total investment in these? 14. 14, man. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty big ROI. Yeah. Nice. Now, now that being said, some of the deals I love are properties that are out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. that are maybe not even buildable or barely have access. Hmm. And there's, there's a little favorite area of mine that I can go and do a mailing and I can get a good number of those properties for 300 bucks a piece, wow. one and a quarter acre lots. Mm -hmm. And I can easily sell those on terms for $3,500 mm -hmm. with like $99 down and low payments. People use them for camping or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, if you figure out buying $14,000 worth of those properties and turning them around, it's a way higher profit on that. It just through the roof higher than doing the big deals like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Cool, man. Yeah. No, I, I know. Um, you know, when you're doing a lot higher volume on smaller deals, especially if you're closing these all yourself, I mean, that does involve a bit of work just in terms of paperwork and logistics and moving documents around, getting signatures. Right. Do you have some kind of a streamlined way that you can do this efficiently or does it just take tons of time to do it? Well, it's, I have a lot of it. I've had a lot of it fairly well streamlined. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife helps me with the business. Mm -hmm. So she has been doing the documents for me, the contracts and deeds and that, that type of stuff. Um, she also handles all the um, owner financing customers. Mm -hmm. And we use QuickBooks online for that. Mm -hmm. It automatically sends out invoices every month. We can get them on auto debit or for their payments and such. And it's, it's pretty user friendly. Mm -hmm. So she handles that. Uh, I use Simplify for uh, recording deeds. I use Sign Now for the document signings for land contracts and such. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, said, I know you said you, you work with your wife. She kind of handles a lot of the detail oriented stuff, deeds and accounting and all that stuff. Um, is it, uh, what's it like to work with your spouse? I know some people, they like, implore people not to do that because apparently they don't work well with their spouse. <laughs> but I mean, do you guys have a good working relationship? Is it, is it ever stressful or hard or? Uh, no, it, it works out well for us. My office is on one end of the house. Her mm -hmm. office is on the other end of the house. Mm -hmm. So we're not in each other's face all yeah. day long. Mm -hmm. If we shared an office, I have a feeling it would not work mm -hmm. quite as well. Yeah, uh, but that's actually a really good have, point. I, I never have a thought about that, but I, yeah, yeah, I can see how that would help. Yeah, yeah, and the way she's very organized, so it does not. She does not need to work on this all day long. Mm -hmm. She can knock out what she needs to do here and there, and then she's either doing, you know, if the kids aren't in school, she's doing things with them or doing whatever it is mm -hmm. she does while I'm yeah. in here. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. It works out. Sure. Yeah. Now, what, where do you think you would be if you didn't have her involved with this to handle the detail stuff? Like, would that have <sighs> severely crippled your ability to grow as fast as you have? Or I say I wouldn't be able to have not done this business, but I wouldn't be at the level that it's at right now mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for that. Yeah. Um, and I can only imagine it, the more difficulty I would have managing all the the people and the finances and the bank accounts and keeping up on all of that would not have been my strong suit at all. I knew uh, just from past correspondence we've had, seller financing is a pretty big deal in your business. Like, yes. is that something, at what point did you decide, okay, we're going to pursue this big time? Like, do you want, want people to do seller financing or is it just yes. make it available and then that's what people choose most of the time? I, I want people to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been the primary part of my business. I do a decent amount of cash sales, but that's just because it just happens that way. Someone yeah. says, Hey, will you take cash? I'm like, oh, sure. I'll take cash. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, no <laughs> problem. Uh, 
but it's I enjoy it because first of all, I think it's much easier to sell something with owner financing. And I tried that very early on, on one of my first few deals. I, there was something that I had put it out there for $5,500 cash, mm-hmm. and nothing, no response at all. Nothing was happening with it. And so now I'm, I'm new and I'm starting to panic. I'm like, Oh no, what happened? This is, yeah. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And then for some reason I thought just for the heck of it, let me do owner financing on this and see what happens. So I raised the price to $10,000, a couple hundred dollars down, a couple hundred dollars document fee and, and easy payments. And I put it out there and it sold that day. Nice. And I'm like, ah, what, mm-hmm. <laughs> what do we have here? Yeah. And ever since then, I just realized there's definitely uh, a lot of people who are looking for that. Yeah. Now, is there uh, you know, a bunch of questions that kind of come to mind with this? So is there a certain dollar amount at which if it's less than, you know, if you're asking less than a certain price, you don't even think about seller financing. It's just cash or nothing. Or say if like if you were selling a property for 3000 bucks, would you let people do seller financing on that? Or is it only 10000 or above or Where's the line for you? I'm three thousand dollars. I'd I'd certainly do owner financing on it. Okay, not not a problem at all. Um, There's a couple times I experimented and did really ridiculously low owner financing, like a thousand dollar lot. I do thirty five dollars a month, (laughs) and that's when your business partner slash wife, who does the accounting and manages the the people <laughs> comes in and says, what are you doing? This is just as much work for me as if it was a $300 payment. Yeah. So I kind of realized that it would be in my best interest to have a little bit of a limit. Mm-hmm. So I usually keep it in a situation where the payments are over a hundred bucks a month and there are at least a few years. And other than that, um, I don't, I don't have a mm-hmm. down limit. Yeah. And I think you said earlier that you're using QuickBooks to uh, collect these payments from people. Yeah. Is there, um, so other than that though, I mean, you're basically serving, servicing all these things in house. You don't have a loan servicing company or a software that's doing this stuff. So like, how do you create an amortization schedule and like keep track of where they are and paying down their balance? Like, is there some software you use for that or? Well, Fortunately for me, my wife uh, is a CPA mm-hmm. um, and she's a whiz at Excel. Mm-hmm. So she built all whatever she does, which I don't know. I don't even know how to use it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even know what I was looking at if I went to her computer. But she has all these formulas and things all set up in Excel that tracks everything. Yeah. So Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine if you're really organized in I know yeah. Excel can do all that stuff. It's yeah. just a matter of if you want to put the pieces in place and keep track. Mm-hmm. Of it, so. Yeah. The only downside to the way we do it as opposed to loan servicing is we don't have a way for a customer to just go online and see what their payoff balance is. Mm-hmm. So we have to deal with the phone calls. What's my payoff? Yeah. And then, you know, I have to have to get that back to them and have to field calls and emails about that, which isn't a huge deal, but it's, that would be one thing that would be nice to get yeah. uh, off of the list of things to do. Yeah. What kind of loan servicing fee are you charging per month? Like is it 15 bucks or 25 or how does that work? I don't charge any mm-hmm. loan servicing fee. I, I think about that from time to time, but uh, that surprises me to hear that just cause I know that's a lot of work to yeah. do that every month. Well, I it charge, be hard to do that. Yeah. I charge 16% interest. Uh, okay. uh, so I figure that's yeah that probably sort of makes up for it. I'm not is, sure what that comes out to, but it comes out to plenty. Mm-hmm. So it's I feel comfortable that I don't need to pile on any other fee yeah. that takes care of it. It's, um, this is sort of getting into territory that I don't fully understand, but I have heard, at least in Michigan, there is a like by law, there is a maximum interest rate percentage you can charge when selling with owner financing. Mm-hmm. I think it was like 10% or again, 
don't quote me on that, but there is some kind of a law in place. Is there anything like that in Florida that you know of? 18%. Okay, cool. So we're okay. I'm assuming you're probably not doing like credit checks or anything like that before you, you just kind of let, let people do it if they want to do it and no questions asked. Right. And to tell you the truth, a, a very surprising percentage of my customers I have had no contact with whatsoever until I get a notification that they've paid the down payment and document fee on my website. Mm -hmm. I hadn't, hadn't had emails with them, hadn't been on the phone with them, just boom, they uh, made that payment with their credit or debit card. And now I have a new terms customer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that, um, uh, I guess two questions now. Uh, of all the people that you are selling to on terms, what percentage of them would you say either pay late or just stop paying and become a problem? Is that a common thing? Or? Uh, yeah, it's very common. Um, I'd say each month late, I'd say there's at least, at least 20 to 30 people who are late. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's a $35 late fee. So it doesn't break our heart too yeah. much. And, and QuickBooks uh, does not automatically charge their card, right? They just get an invoice and then they have to manually pay it. Is that right? Uh, we can set it up either way. Oh, okay. uh, they cool. can, they can be set up uh, for credit or debit card or ACH. Okay. Uh, so out of the checking account. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can do it automated or just as they get their invoice each month. So if somebody does, you know, pay late or stop paying altogether, what is your process to get that property back? Like what hoops do you have to jump through in Florida to make that happen? Well, here's the process that we do. When they're late, they'll get a, a polite late notice. Um, and we, we give them time. We give them more time than is specified in our contracts because we want to work for people. My intention is never to take something back from somebody. I want to avoid that if I can. But if just week after week, month after month, there's just no response. Mm -hmm. And finally, it'll get to a point where we send a 10 day demand letter, which will spell out the balance they need to pay to get caught up to date or their lot will be forfeited. If they don't, heed that in the 10 days, then we send a letter saying, you, you know, your lot's been forfeited. Um, now I, I do contract for deed land contract. Um, there's a lot of talk about in the state of Florida, you could, could go through a foreclosure process just like as if it's a mortgage. Well, that's if a person would contest this or, or have a dispute with this, mm -hmm. that has never happened to me. Um, and if they did, if they said, Hey, you know, you can't take this. I, I intend on paying it. I would work with them or refinance them or do whatever we needed to do uh, to try to work with them. So it's just, it's something that scares people away from doing land, land contracts in Florida, but it's just a theoretical, this could possibly happen if this person did this, which just doesn't happen. Yeah. Oh, my experience. Your, yeah, yeah, it's good to hear your firsthand experience on that. Yeah. Um, and going back a few minutes when you're talking about how people can, you know, do their down payment and start paying through your website. Explain to me how that works. Is that all with QuickBooks? Like, is there just a button on your website where you can, they can click, make the down payment. And then at what point is like this payment schedule created? Is that something your wife does manually or how does that oh. work? Yeah, that part is is not integrated with QuickBooks at this okay. time. Right now, it's just a separate, like a shopping cart type of situation. And mm -hmm. the initial down payment and document fee goes through Stripe so okay. far. So good. Um, I did use Square at first, but they yanked me because it being the land business, which they weren't happy yeah. about. So. Yeah. I would be ready for Stripe to do that. Oh yeah, I know it's it's coming yeah. <laughs> now, maybe even sooner. But Although, and we're actually going to have a conversation with, uh, at least it's in our calendar to have a conversation with somebody from Heartland Payment Systems, and they do like it's totally stamp approved. They can do this kind of stuff for Lance specifically. So, when Stripe does 
pull the plug on you. You could always go over there. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a possibility too. So I'm ready for that to happen. I'll, I'll adjust as mm-hmm. need be. Cool. So. When they, when they do make that payment, like they're making it through Stripe, you get the notification and then like, does your wife create the payment schedule and do you guys like manually send them invoices every month, like through the, through email? That's how that works. No. Well, as of right now, my wife makes the contracts. Mm-hmm. She'll, I'll, I'll send her the information through email that they used when they set up their name and address and all their contact information and the property information. And mm-hmm. she does that. Now, uh, in terms of getting your property sold, it sounds like it's pretty, you know, not that difficult when you're using seller financing with these properties in Florida. Right. Is there uh, are there certain websites that you re- rely on heavily to get these things sold? Mm-hmm. Like what does your marketing plan look like? Yeah. Well, the most important thing to me is my buyer's list. Buyer's list. Okay. I, uh, I have certainly, uh, that, that has been great. Awesome. Uh, just blasting out emails. I can get stuff sold really quickly. Mm-hmm. Craigslist has been from day one. I've used Craigslist, mm-hmm. gotten a lot out of that. I'd use a land flip land moto. Uh, I, I do use Facebook. Sometimes I question whether the time suck on that one is worth the sales that I get off it. I'm Mm -hmm. undecided on that, but I do uh, through Facebook marketplace and groups and such. Mm -hmm. Um, I did do through the different lands websites, uh, you know, the land watch lands of America land and farm, but Mm -hmm. it, for me, maybe because I do lower priced, uh, properties in general, I was not getting results that were worth what they were charging. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. What is like the, the typical range of property values you're working with? Like, like what's the most expensive one that you've ever done? Or, and then when you look at like common, like the 80, 20, like, like the 80% of deals that you do, what range do they typically fall into? A lot of my bread and butter uh, deals are, are certain areas that I work over and over again, which I also recommend mm-hmm. because you get to know the areas, but there's a certain area that I do that it's just very quick and easy to buy a property for $1,100, turn around and sell it on terms for $3,500 to $4,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, another area I buy them for 2300 turn around and sell them on terms for 7,000. Mm-hmm. Those are kind of like the base hits that I spoke about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, there's the low end high profit properties like mm-hmm. buy for 300, sell for 3,500. Mm-hmm. Those type of ones. There's a few different areas that I can uh, get deals like that going, but that's, you know, the $3,500 is probably the cap on what I can charge for those kind of properties. So it's a, you know, it's not glamorous. Mm -hmm. How many current deals do you have on terms right now? Like, do you have an idea, approximate number? I think it's, it fluctuates, but I think it's probably about a, maybe 120 active contracts right now. Something like that. All righty. I know with this being your, your only source of income, that seller financing has probably been a pretty important part of just smoothing that out and making it more predictable, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, is that is that part of why you were wanting to go the seller financing road so much? Probably that and also because they sell so much faster? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's nice to just know approximately what's coming in mm-hmm. every month. So make sure that our expenses are covered and we have money coming in for new acquisitions and such. So yeah, that part keeps it smooth. Mm -hmm. Now I have my, my, my high points and low points as far as acquisitions and sales sometimes just because if I have decided to create a little chaos and do a huge mailing or something like that. So Mm -hmm. yeah, our peaks and valleys a little bit uh, for, for new deals here Mm -hmm. and there, but it, it pretty much ends up even and out. When you're doing your direct mail stuff these days, are you, is it like uh, blind offers? Is that kind of like your... Blind offers. Okay. And how many are you sending out at a time typically? That 
fluctuates a little bit. Uh, there have been times I've done as many as 10,000 at a time, oh. mm-hmm. which gets rough when, mm-hmm. they're, when they're out there. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes if I'm testing a new area, I'll do 500 to 1,000. Um, and again, back to, back to the land speed thing there, it's that setup that I can kind of easily push a little bit of mail out every day Mm-hmm. That might smooth it and make it less spiky for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm testing that as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. But what would you say is your long-term plan? Like, where do you want this business to go in the next five years? Like, you just going to kind of work this for the rest of your working life? Or do you want to do something else or expand into some other business? No, I want to, uh, I want to keep gradually building the, the terms uh, business. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's going to be a point not too far from now where that's really, I have enough. Mm -hmm. So I would just kind of maintain that monthly level. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I'm, I've been tossing around the idea of making some kind of, uh, some sort of not wholesale as in like wholesaling, but a wholesale priced properties for, land investors that they can just get a property with a a due diligence package already attached and maybe some marketing all ready, you know, planned out and, you know, all the information um, and just do a lot of cash deals Mm -hmm. that way and just, just play around with that. Once, once uh, my term deals are exactly where I want them to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, I just thought of one other question I meant to ask you earlier. When you were talking about how your buyer's list is a really important part of your selling process. So I guess question one is how big is your buyer's list and how have you built it to that point? Maybe 2,600 people in it, I think, something like that. Um, I haven't looked recently Mm -hmm. at at the number. Um, And it's basically wherever I advertise as much as I'm able to on that platform, I try to drive people to my website. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the number one thing. I always try to get them to the, to the website cause I want them to go there. I want them to get a pop up to join the buyer's list or, or see the uh, form at the bottom to join the buyer's list. So I always try to funnel them. Anyone who contacts me, I try one way or the other to get their eyeballs on my, website and so they they sign up through there okay and that uh when you say send them to your website is that like the website where you have all your property listings or is it just a landing page with nothing else other than no i have the property listings there yeah okay gotcha and on that buyer's list would you say does most of the activity happen with like a super tiny percentage of those people or is it like just people all over the place like everybody like there's hundreds of people on that 2,600 that will sporadically buy stuff. Well, there, there's a certain number of repeat buyers, but since I do so much on, on terms, it's mm. not a, a ton of repeat buyers. I have yeah. some. Um, I, I get a lot of people who, oh, I get a pretty good open rate mm. uh, when I send the emails. Uh, but I think, a lot of the people who buy, most of the people who buy off my buyer's list is because they just missed something. Mm-hmm. They missed, I had a, a property in one area, one subdivision, and when they went to get it, it, it had just sold. Mm-hmm. So then they see it come, another one in the same area come back, so then they jump on it. Mm-hmm. So selling so much with owner financing, I assume most of the buyers are like the end user, right? It's not like an investor who's going to, buy it from you and then flip it again. It's mostly accurate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of getting people to get on that buyer's list, is there like, other than just having a pop-up, like, is there anything you do to entice them to sign up? Like any specific wording you use, like sign up and you'll get this or you have a video or anything, or how do you convince people to do it? You know, Seth, that's one thing about, doing everything myself and not having VAs and not having a system since day one, I have wanted to make some little ebook or something to entice people with, but I just haven't found the time. I'm so busy spinning the plates of my 
core yeah. business that I haven't been able to do some of those things, especially like building content. I really want to build content on my website and I just haven't had the chance. So no, there's no enticement, but there will be mm -hmm. someday. Yeah. someday. Hey, Matt, if, if anybody understands what you just said there, it's me. There's, there's yeah. so many things I would love to do that will never happen because I just yeah. don't have point. So yeah. I get it. Uh, so when you look back at all your experience, everything you've done, you've obviously seen a lot in these years that you've been in this land business. Like, are there any particularly good or bad experiences where you've learned a lot from them or has anything surprised you as you've been working the land business? Yeah. I'll start with some bad because yeah. so many people you hear talk about the land business and make it out to be perfect mm -hmm. and so different because there's no tenants and toilets and all of that type of yeah. stuff. But it, in reality, there are things that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I consistently have problems with terms buyers doing things on the property that they should not be doing. Uh, dragging an old mobile home onto the property, with mm. no permits, um, hoarding piles of chunk on the properties, yeah. doing all things like that. And then I, the first I find out about it is I get a, a citation from yeah. the county. I've gotten that too. <laughs> yeah. And then I have to spring into action and try to get uh, these things taken care of. And mm. that is, irritates me yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a part that comes up and now that i have a good amount of term spires my just the law of averages has made that something that comes up more and more that, until about a year or two ago i never had that problem that's actually it's an interesting point you bring up though about you know when you're doing the seller financing thing like the problem is still sort of in your lap because you still own it until that thing mm -hmm. is paid off and like I know when I was in the banking world, one of the things that we always had to track, it was super annoying, was just making sure that every borrower on our books had their property taxes paid current. Because if they didn't, then that affects our collateral. And I know like, for example, in, in your case, are you paying property taxes for them? Like, are you collecting an escrow or is it just like, no, this is on you to do it? We pay all the property taxes and then we invoice the terms oh. customer after okay. we've paid them. Yeah, we want to make sure that they're paid. So the best, the guaranteed way to make sure if they're paid is for us to pay them. So yeah. that's what we do. Okay. Is there any other kind of monitoring that you have to do in terms of, I mean, I'm assuming the answer is no, because that would be horribly inefficient. But I mean, other than just waiting to get citations from the local municipality, do you like drive by its property just to make sure everything's still okay or you don't mess with any of that? I've, I've been tempted, but I restrain myself from doing that. I have, there's a couple of areas where this problem has been prevalent. I've kind of made friends with the code enforcement people mm -hmm. and proactively told them, look, go check out my properties. If you see even anything that mm -hmm. looks inappropriate, even just starting, you tell me right away and I'll nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. So just getting, making friends with these people, I obviously is the thing to do. So yeah. now I, I'll get an email or a phone call first in these areas that, Hey, we've got this situation and then I can deal with it before it escalates. Mm -hmm. So sure. it's, yeah. Okay. So far that's the best thing I could figure out to do. If somebody is listening to this, maybe they've been thinking about the land business. Maybe they've kind of heard the different things people have said about it. It just sort of makes sense to them and they are thinking about getting started. Is there any word of advice you would have for those people who are interested and, you know, just kind of looking to dip their toe in the water? What would you say to them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I get on Facebook, especially I get contacted by people who are new or in the business or contemplating yeah. the business all the time. Mm -hmm. And it seems there's a consistent thing that they ask. Like they, they can't believe that this is real. Like mm -hmm. this is a real thing that works. Yeah. What they hear on podcasts like yours is true and real. Mm -hmm. And I'm just here to tell them, yes, it's real. Suspend your disbelief. Mm -hmm. Just as faith that it will work. 
mm-hmm. because it does. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. It's not a complicated business at mm-hmm. all. Yeah. That would be the number one thing. If you want to do it, if it seems like something you would enjoy doing, just start. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting. I, I hear from a lot of people as well, as you can imagine. And it seems like some people, it's like one of two are extremes. Some people are either like all in, like they've just, yes, like I want to do it. Just let's do it. Just ignore any sense of caution. Let's jump into it. And other people are super skeptical about it. And it's kind of like you need a balance of both. Like you have to be excited enough to jump in and start moving, but you have to believe that there are issues that are going to come up as well. And, you know, not overreact or quit the first time you see a problem, but just realize, you know, this is not going to be a totally easy road. I need to figure out how to deal with that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So at the end of every show, Mike, something we've been doing is asking three just interesting sort of non real estate related questions uh, just to kind of find out a little bit more about how you tick and what's going on really inside Mike's head. So oh boy. the first question here is what is your biggest fear? Oh, I, I suppose my, my biggest fear when I'm kind of thinking of business is a economic disaster of some sort. Yeah. Uh, personally, um, failure just in general I've had it my whole life. And, uh, it's just something that makes me tick. I guess I, I fight it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I, when I am successful and like this business, I have, there's always that little thing in my head. Oh, that's just a fluke. You know, you're still going to fail yeah. you know, something's going to happen, but you know, We've all got our things. So that's one of mine. Yeah. And when you say failure, you're mostly talking about like some kind of financial catastrophe or like the business would dry up or stop working. Like, like mostly an economic failure. Is that what you mean? Yeah, mostly. Um, I have a couple of small boys too, mm-hmm. young boys. And so uh, of course that ups the ante yeah. beyond <laughs> anything I ever experienced before. So I always think about them and uh, providing for my family and keeping them safe and healthy and being a good dad and Mm -hmm. balancing my business with my parenting, which is not always easy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it could be failure in being a good dad because I'm doing too much in the business. So I, you know, the way I look, it can rear its ugly head. Yeah. It seems like life is a, constant balancing act in every possible horizon. It's like, you don't want to do too much or too little. You got to kind of find that middle ground. It's not easy to do. Yeah. So what would you say you are most proud of? Hmm. You know, in, in, while we've been talking, I spoke about my two business successes the, the gold business and now this business. Uh, what I didn't speak of was the dozens and dozens of things I tried before and in between that failed and mm-hmm. failed and failed. And I tried and I failed and I tried and I failed. All these other little things, all these ideas that would pop into my head. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never stopped trying. I pick myself up, dust myself off and hit it again and again and again. Yeah. And I, and I do that in every aspect of my life. If, if I'm not doing well at something, I just dust myself off and just keep going and keep trying and I never give up. Yeah. So that's what I'm proud of. Yeah. <clears throat> Successful people are those who just don't know when they're beat, right? They yeah, just exactly. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say is the most important lesson you've ever learned? Live below my means. Mm. That ties into my previous business. When it was going great, I bought a big house, had the boat, had mm. ATV, had bought up all the land around the house, did, you know, I, I lived large. Mm-hmm. Uh, not ridiculously, but 
more than I needed to. Yeah. And then when the chain of events happened and that money wasn't coming in anymore, that was not fun yeah. anymore. That's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow for sure. Yes. And I, I sold and sold and sold because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to lose what I had mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And now I, I live in a modest house. I see boat. I live in Florida. I see boats all the time. I want a boat so bad, mm -hmm. but I don't buy it because now I look at it and I say, well, that's that boat there is at least 50 grand. You know what I could turn that into if I bought a bunch of lots and, yeah. and, and so I live way below my means now. So I won't ever have to be in that sort of situation again. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times, the things you own end up owning you, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, and that's, I, back when you were doing really well and you had the bigger house and I guess even before, you know, you had to downsize, like, did you, I mean, just honestly, like, did you feel any happier or was your stress level higher or lower or I don't know, how, how would that life con contrast to how it is today? I was happy. Yeah. I was, I was happy. Uh, at least I fooled myself that I was happy. I think I was happy. Yeah. Um, it's, I like having money and, mm -hmm. and stuff. Is, well, that's weird. Just kidding. <laughs> I, know. I did but, too. Uh, but I, I, I don't have a lot of the shiny objects right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have assets mm -hmm. and, um, I'm happier and I sleep better. Mm -hmm. Uh, knowing that I don't have to fear that I will lose those things. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. It's been a really fun conversation, really informative. If people want to learn any more about your business or do you have like a website or anything you want to share or no pressure, you don't have to, but no, you it'd be great. Well, I'm, I'm on the uh, Facebook group for Ari tipster. I'm in there. Sweet. And I, I, I post in there every once in a that's while. Right. I see you all the time. And, uh, and so that's an easy place uh, or my website, uh, I, my buying website, I guess you could go to is mikebuysland.com. And there's a contact form there and people can reach out and say hi that way or cool. I'm around. Yeah. Love awesome, man. People. Yeah. And Mike has a lot of great contributions in the, in the, community as well so i appreciate everything you've contributed there and and uh and yeah mike we should do this again in a year or sure. two uh, i'd love to see, see if you're still doing well yeah. and see if anything's yeah. changed and i'm sure life will be going awesome so oh, oh i'm sorry excuse me yeah. uh, seth i'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you there but there's something that i is really important that i have not said yet in this podcast and really yeah, what's that? said you my friend have been an inspiration to me. It's what you put out there on the internet and the Ari tipster club and all of that was a very integral part of me getting into this business and learning this business. And I do not know if I would have been able to do it without what I learned from you. So wow. I just want to say thank you. That's so good to hear, man. I appreciate you yeah. sharing that. That yeah. That's why I do all this stuff. So that's very, very gratifying. I appreciate you saying that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, man, I appreciate it. Again, everything you've contributed and uh, just for sharing your, your thoughts and your heart and everything that's uh, been going on in your business. And yeah, to all the listeners out there, if you guys want to check out the show notes for this episode, this is episode number 44. So all of the... I've got a big list here, a lot of links and different stuff we've talked about. You can find all that stuff listed out at retipster.com forward slash 44. And um, yeah, that wraps up for today. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the next episode. All right. See ya. <laughs>